Thank you, Silly, and thank you, Aline, for this interesting conversation. And now we are moving into another topic. Um, we are going to talk the, the next um, time about um, standardization, data spaces standardization. I hope that all of you are interested on this topic. And for that, first, we will have an interesting speech from the European Commission. And, and then we will move to, to talk about uh, standardization, the interoperability standardization with the presentation of a report from the High Level Forum. And after this presentation, we will enter into the roundtable model with um, different participants, experts on the standardization that we will talk about these topics. So first, um, it's a pleasure for me to present Bor sorry, Joern Zuretsky, so I have pronounced it well. Borjan is, is head of unit of data policy and innovation from DigiConnect. Welcome and thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. It is a complicated name, so I'm used to that kind of thing. So no worries, no worries. So good to be here with you again and grateful to see so many people interested in standardization, which can be a bit of a dry topic, but it's really absolutely essential for, for what we are doing here. I mentioned it earlier already in my speech that we want to create this um, European single market for data. Um, and for that to happen, we really have to have interoperability between um, all the data spaces, um, especially also for SMEs so that they can really um, scale up um, the adoption of data technologies and data spaces and, and more generally. Um, we have defined some essential requirements in the Data Act, but that's not enough. I mean, we have to go beyond that and go into more detail. Um, and this is what we are doing with um, standardization and standardization requests. Um, so to talk a bit more in detail about um, you know, our strategy for standardization, there's an overall uh, European standardization strategy. And in the last couple of months, um, we and my colleague Kuhn, who will speak later, really made sure that um, data and data spaces are very prominently um, placed in this European standardization strategy so that we can use that then to launch, for example, um, a request for a harmonized standard in certain topics. That was the, the first um, order of the day that we had to get a foot in the door, basically. Um, we have also set up the European Data Innovation Board. I mentioned that earlier as well already. Um, and one of the big tasks of the European Data Innovation Board is to look into interoperability requirements for data spaces. Uh, we have all the competent authorities in there, industry bodies, and also um, the European standardization organizations are represented there. So this is like the steering board, if you want, for the data economy more generally, but also specifically for um, standardization um, um, issues. I also would like to mention the High Level Forum for European Standardization. Um, that's a body that looks um, into standardization in a number of areas. Um, and one of the work streams in this High Level Forum deals with um, data. And we are very happy that we also have Stefan Weisgerber here from the German Institute for Norms. He's the chair of the um, High Level Forum and he will also participate in the uh, panel session now and um, will present actually the final report that will be adopted or has been adopted will be adopted um, on data interoperability. So this is really a very important document and uh, thanks a lot, Stefan, for being here and for all the work you've uh, done here. So after Stefan's presentation, we will then enter um, a panel discussion um, with my colleague Kuhn um, and we have representatives from standardization organizations and the data spaces community to discuss these questions um, on interoperability. And so I'm looking forward to a very productive and uh, fruitful discussion. Um, and now it's time for um, Stefan, I guess, to um, start his presentation. Thanks a lot. Uh, th thank you. Thank you, Bjorn, also for, for the kind introduction. Um, standardization standardization data spaces. And you've also already been talking about this uh, report. And before we go into that report, um, I can imagine that not everybody of you is following standardization in a level of detail or in an intensity that uh, lets you know what, <coughs> what the, this, this high level forum, the high level what is about. 
Uh, Björn referenced also uh, already the, the um, uh, standardization strategy, sta uh, strategy on standardization uh, that was released by the European Commission in 2022. And there, there is a part <coughs> saying that such a high level forum on European standardization should be established. That is not on standardization as such, as not, not, not doing standardization, not, not writing standards, but rather looking at standardization from a more strategic level uh, in order to, to see how the, the, the further development of the European single market, the development of, of European uh, economy, etc., at all, can be supported by, by standardization. Uh, therefore, it has, I have put that here on the slide, it has uh, three main points on the agenda, namely uh, to identify standardization priorities, identify avenues for action to support that European single market in three strategic areas, green, digital, and resilient. And um, one outcome should be to um, align policy priorities, uh, industrial innovation, investment activities and standardization in order to form one common coherent activity. And uh, when trying to establish common coherent activities, it is always good um, to, to go for this kind of, of multi-stakeholder approach to ensure that really all perspectives um, are on the table and can be um, integrated. In the digital sector, um, there, there are currently three work streams in the high-level forum. The first one is on artificial intelligence. Uh, the second one has just started on, on the digital product passport. And the third one is the one we're talking about here, uh, data interoperability. Um, and um, I'm having the, the pleasure and, and really honor to, to chair this, this work stream. Um, which started with a workshop and very extensive discussions. The, the DSSC was uh, in, uh, involved in, in various stages and provided really great help, great support as is in your mission. That was wonderful. Uh, we have now delivered the report and it is just now uh, in the final approval stage. That means uh, if nobody, if not uh, many, people uh, will object in the, last, in the next uh, two weeks, it will be endorsed. And um, as we had fairly intensive discussions, as I mentioned, um, I, I don't really expect that, I must say. That would really be a surprise. So, to, to familiarize you a little bit with um, where this report came from, or, or what, what the, the original thinking uh, was to, to, to um, go for, for such an activity, starting from the data regulation, the EU data regulation, which at the end of the day aims at creating a, a, a vibrant data ecosystem while also safeguarding civil rights and, and techno, uh, technological sovereignty. So bring these things together. And um, talking about a data ecosystem, and I know this is a little bit now uh, carrying coals to Newcastle um, in, in this audience here. Um, it, it's obviously about uh, the possibility to share data um, in an in open, so well-controlled way in several directions. First, uh, to, to support and to implement data-driven business models, uh, to support the establishment of digital public uh, infrastructures, and also to, to leverage the use of research data also for advanced insights. That means, for example, ex accessing data that one uh, wouldn't have become aware of uh, in earlier times. The FAIR principles are a big thing, so FAIR is probably well known here. Uh, findability, accessibility, interoperability, and reusability of data. Interoperability, this, the the ability to, to work together in, in a productive way uh, is obviously uh, a, a key thing in a distributed environment. And all this 
can very well be supported by establishing the right mix of standards. That, that was the, so to say, the original thinking uh, which with we, we went to uh, go for this report. Topics addressed in the report are, first of all, the, the policy perspective, outlining what the, the regulations say, the Data Act, um, and, and others. Uh, we look at uh, data space interoperability, which is very much connected to the work of the DSSC and, and the Common European Data Spaces. But then also data interoperability, um, where we have uh, taken four uh, focus areas. One is data governance, in order to support this, this, this trust thing. Um, data discovery, uh, data are not worth anything if you don't know that you, they are there and if, if you can't find them. The data sharing and data usage. And for all these focus areas, we have uh, first of all done an analysis of what is out there, etc. What are the interoperability needs? What are supporting standards? Where one must say there is excellent work on, on uh, analyzing the the uh, standards landscape available already. We did not try to, to um, repeat that, but rather um, look at some, some uh, dedicated things. And apart from that, uh, if one goes uh, for the um, ICT, um, ICT rolling plan uh, by the multi-stakeholder platform for ICT standardization, or the uh, standards landscape that has been done by the DSSC, there one can find much, much more detail on uh, what standards are out there. <coughs> Last but not least, we put together uh, some key questions, and these key questions are, at the end of the day, in a first step towards an answer uh, condensed in 17 recommendations, uh, in, uh, which are grouped in, in four groups. And I will try to <laughs> really compress these 17 recommendations in, in a few lines. Um, the first group is on standardization. And the, the recommendations given on standardization as such are at the end of the day about tying things together. I mean, um, there is European standardization, which, which has been a very powerful tool in the implementation of the uh, common European single market uh, for, for decades. There's international standardization with the ambition of Europe to play an important role there. Uh, there are the SDOs like W3C uh, Oasis, which have done extremely valuable and important and relevant work. And there's the data spaces community, the European one. And I think the, the states here have given quite an impressive glimpse of, of uh, the variety and, and the um, the extent of that community. Taking all that together in order to maximize the impact is uh, one of the big uh, recommendations which is broken down in, in um, uh, some more detail. Then on data interoperability, there are various concrete recommendations to guide uh, the standardization work on data governance, data uh, discovery, um, data sharing, and data usage, the, the four focus groups I mentioned already. Data spaces interoperability, two things. First of all, uh, to have a sort of tool to, to look at the maturity of common European data spaces, um, something like a scorecard, and uh, to ensure, and this is also, I think, very important, to ensure the broad ex uh, acceptance of the, DSCs, of the DSSC results through standardization by making them visible also beyond Europe. Um, last but not least, there are some supporting actions described um, on how to tie uh, together also um, open source projects, notably the simple project we heard about uh, right now. Then um, research results, who have often the problem that they do not have the funding to use standardization as a transfer instrument for their outcomes. Um, the availability of experts, standardization costs time. You have to, to send people to, to standardization projects, to, to committees, to, you have to edit documents, etc., etc. That takes time. You need experts. And um, there is obviously some, some shortage, shortage of such experts. 
Um, last but not least, a very specific one on uh, device data where we um, recommend a research project. So that was the attempt to condense all that into one slide. The question is what now? Um, as I mentioned, I expect that the report uh, will go public by end of the month. And some of the recommendations I just touched on uh, will be subject of uh, the subsequent panel discussion, what I'm looking forward quite a lot. And last but not least, I would really like to thank uh, the ECC people, Daniel Alonso, uh, Silvia Castelli, Julia Pampus, Clara Pesuela, and others uh, for their contributions, which have really helped a lot and uh, uh, helped really to, to uh, make that report possible. Last but not least, I would like to thank you uh, for listening, for your interest in the exciting topic of standardization. Thanks. I, I want to thank you, Stefan. And now I want to introduce uh, Con Johnson from the European Commission. And he will moderate the round table. Con, if you can come here. And I would like to, to thank you for all your support on the standardization activities. Great job. And thank you, Sylvia. Um, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, so my name is Koen Janssen, and it is internationally not interoperable. I've noticed that before, uh, but it's a Dutch name. Um, I will first introduce or bring on stage the, the panelists. Um, so let me introduce now Stefan, you know already. Um, we have also here interesting role change. Sylvia Castelvi, please come to the stage in her role as Director of Research and Standardization of IDSA. Um, Antonio Kuhn, um, CEO of Trialog and yeah, the guru on ISO and GTC1 committees. Um, Frederic Belesch, Vice President of Technology and Research at Dalex. And uh, Georg Rehm, Principal Researcher and Research Fellow at the DF. KY, which stands for something with artificial intelligence. And finally, uh, Pierre-Antoine Champagne, uh, data strategist at the W3C. As you can see, uh, we have tried to bring together some experts from the standardization committee, uh, committees or world community and from the data spaces community. And that's also the, the gist behind the report that Stefan just presented. Um, I will first um, briefly introduce the, the way we have structured the discussion, the panel discussion, uh, by showing one slide. If everything went well, that is now. Come, oh, I do it myself. OK, that's, that's even easier. Hmm. Right, here we have. Um, so this slide is kind of repeating what Stefan just explained, ha the structure of the report. And we, in the report, we have identified data interoperability and data space interoperability as separate concepts. Um, data interoperability is very much about the processes between the players in a data space. Um, and there hey, you have the data holders, data users, and also the intermediaries and the trust the providers. Um, and the processes hey, that we have identified or process areas are data governance, data discovery, uh, data sharing and data usage. And this is also will come back in the, in the way we have um, set up the, the, the recommendations and the, and the discussion. On the data space interoperability, there we are really looking ha at the way to set up data spaces, to convert, to make sure that uh, wheels are not invented in various places. And this, of course, where the DSSC work is, uh, is of crucial value uh, with the, the building blocks and, and the blueprint. Um, this is the, also the way we have now structured the, the discussion. And we will first look at the first team, which is around data sharing. Um, and for that, I will take a seat myself as well and bring my clicker. Uh, 
Um, yeah, that works. So here you see one of the recommendations of the uh, report, of the High Level Forum, and it talks about the trusted data transactions, uh, which is actually an existing project, um, a SEN workshop on trusted data transactions, and the recommendation is to further leverage that and build that out to a real harmonized standard. Um, as a first question to Frederik, uh, who is one of the initiators of this project, what is the main thinking behind this workshop? What was the, the reason that it was started? Um, well, thank you, Kun. Um, well, we, we all know the context. Um, we, we, live, we live in the data world, right? Uh, data must flow. So if we want all the, the, the participants of a data ecosystem to work together, we have to come up with a, a clear framework to organize the way that data is exchanged, data is consumed, data is acquired, uh, data is used, and so forth. And within this framework, we have to embed the notion of trust, which is extremely important because that's the heart of the economy. So that was the, the, the main point, the, the, the starting idea of this initiative. Um, is to properly define what a data transaction is and to go further and to describe collectively uh, to standardize what a trusted data transaction is. Uh, this is an idea which uh, came up a year ago. Uh, just checking my notes to, to see the, the, the exact dates. Uh, I don't want to, to say silly things. Um, so. Um, this is, uh, it started in April 2023, um, uh, at least in the first phase, and it's, uh, it's a group of, well, I believe some of the most interesting people in, around the data economy and the data ecosystem. Uh, it's a collective effort with Rhinofer, Tino, IDSA, Fireware, uh, BDVA, GaiaX, Microsoft, Tarwex, iData, one. I'm probably missing a couple of uh, actors, and things which is, of great importance, uh, the European Commission uh, is, al is also on board uh, this, uh, this collective effort. Um, the, 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 this is uh, a, standardiz a, standardiz sorry, a standardization process, so it takes some time. Uh, it's a two-phase process, phase one, phase two. Uh, we've ended the first phase uh, a couple of, uh, a month ago so far. Uh, in this first phase, we collectively define all the terminolo terminology and the vocabulary that we will need to properly define and uh, quantify the trust in the data transaction. Uh, this was a huge amount of work uh, with many people, uh, but nevertheless, we came to a conclusion, a collective conclusion and published this phase one uh, about a month ago. And in this uh, collective work, in this workshop, we have defined uh, all the different terminology, what data is, what data, uh, metadata, what a data provider, what a data consumer, and all the wording around what a data transaction is, uh, and we set the scope of it. Um, uh, using all the brand from IDSC, DCC, and all and BDV and Dawex, and all the, and, and your words, uh, to correctly come to this uh, broad picture. So this is an agreement. Uh, it's been published uh, a, a month ago, and the phase now is closed. And then there was a, a phase of open comments, uh, which is now closed too. Uh, there were many comments, so we're going to treat them and uh, include it in the in, in the paper. And then enter phase two. Uh, the the next session will be uh, the third of uh, April. Probably we'll focus on the comments. And on the next session, we're going to work on the phase two, which will be aiming at properly define the characteristic of a data transaction. I mean, namely, uh, putting real definition of what it is and a way to measure the trust in a data transaction. So it's gonna be a, a hard work because there are a lot of ideas. Uh, we, in the previous session, came with idea how to handle that. We'll see how it goes. Like I say, it's a collective work. Uh, it's gonna take some time, probably, probably a year, the idea is to get to the end of phase two by the end of the, world, uh, of the, of the year, 
not the word, not the year. Uh, and this is a pre-standardization process, meaning that uh, the next step will be to get a proper standard and probably an harmonized standard, which would be great. Thank you, Frederic. Um, over to uh, Sylvia, um, could you go into the relation and we know that there is also a data space protocol and connectors, and what is the link of those, that standard with the trusted data transaction? Could you shed your light on that? So you're, I forgot to mention you were heavily involved in this project, yes. uh, so uh, you speak from, from the inside here. And yes, we, we are contributing to the, to the trusted data transaction with the, um, with the discussions that we have on IDSA working groups on the architecture, the reference architecture to guide us, the principles and how to implement the data spaces, and also on the data space protocol working group, but also the rule book. So our community, or members, uh, define how to create, how to establish trusted data transaction, and the data space protocol that you will find in the DSSC blueprint, but also on the high level forum report that has been presented by Stefan, introduce how we can agree in using a protocol that gives us how to publish data in a common way, how to negotiate, how to agree with this data, with the policies, and, and then finally how to agree how to transfer the data, okay? So this is what the data space protocol is uh, describing, and this is what we are contributing to the trusted data transaction to uh, this, uh, this workshop, this committee, to bring in this uh, knowledge from the, the members of IDSA and also other members that, from other uh, environments that are um, building on how to provide trust, but also how to achieve this interoperability. Because when we are talking about interoperability, and it has been commented in other sessions, that uh, it's not just that we are interoperable in a data space, that it is, okay? If I, if I am a participant and I want to share data in, inside a data space, uh, I need to be able to do it in an easy way, okay? Machine readable with agents or connectors that supports that. But also if I want to talk with another, um, if I want to share data trusted data with other uh, data spaces, intra data space in other domain, I, I, I have to be uh, compliance standardized. And this is what we are building and contributing to this uh, trusted data transaction. Okay. Thank you, Sylvia. Um, well, as b will be clear uh, that um, the knowledge, uh, because we are talking about the project in a, one of the European standardization organizations, and this is a question for Stefan. Um, so how can European standardization organizations uh, enable that the knowledge of the data space experts uh, is really leveraged there? Uh, so what are the ways to do that? Uh, well, I would say there are two ways, two directions. The first one is, is in a sense, uh, could call it downstream maybe. Uh, look, look at what, what is out there in terms of standards, uh, make that transparent, and make that usable in projects. I think, you, for example, the DSSC has already done quite some work on that. Um, but there's one more stage, I would say, that is, you can take standards or you can make standards. That means you can take the insights that you have gained in your projects, the, the developments, and make them av available to the wider community by contributing them to, to standards, which also um, increases, obviously, the footprint of those solutions because they are known to others, they will be used by others, and they will make up in, in terms of interoperability a, a further dimension uh, for the interoperability also outside, let's say, for example, the European data spaces community. Well, I think that this is, this is a large potential that, that one should not lose, and that is very much in line with uh, several European strategies. Uh, it is, similar things are described in the standardization strategy, 
software is really an ambition to, to uh, increase the, the, the footprint uh, of, of European technology through standardization. Thank you. Um, yeah, we talked here about the data sharing, huh? and this is this notion um, have, when you talk about restricted data and not open data, that you need to do something extra. There needs to be an agreement, there needs to be clarity on the conditions and access. Um, but of course, that's only part of the story. Uh, in the end, you also want to be able to use the data effectively uh, for, to create value. And that's the next recommendation, and let's move there. Um, and this is, uh, this recommendation um, uh, um, proposes uh, to initiate a clear framework, European framework for trusted ontologies, um, and uh, basically a way to make ontologies effective, uh, sustainable, uh, uh, and, and available in data spaces. The, the challenge there uh, are, are legio, um, and so we have some experts here that really can shed their light on that. Um, so on how to do this, uh, and I think the key word is in an effective way, uh, without not over, over uh, designing. Um, let's first go to Antonio. Um, so how can semantics in general, how can they help in, 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 uh, to, to increase interoperability in data spaces? Uh, what are the main and what are the main challenges you see around ontologies, for instance? Okay, Th thank you. So, um, data is everywhere, and uh, standardization on data is also everywhere. Uh, we need to put them together, and uh, in particular to uh, s uh, to focus on uh, the semantics. Okay, so when you start in the life cycle, you have data provenance. There is a standard that's been done SC twenty seven, so we need to take into account. Okay. We also have, need to have a, a way of t describing the usage of data. And there are two standards in SC32 that are going to be published, data usage concept, data usage guidance, okay, which uh, we can also use. Okay. And uh, then uh, you have the description of the data, which is actually metadata in the BDVA. We just published uh, last year a document on the need to share data, but also to share metadata. Okay. And metadata, if you got uh, uh, a little bit further, uh, you have ontologies because actually you want to describe the concepts that you are sharing, okay? So if I have uh, something on health, on, on, on finance, and things like that, so I need to, when I'm sharing the data, I need to understand it's about the same thing, okay? So we come to the, uh, to the problem that we need to share the ontologies. There's another standard in SC32 published in 2020 on ontology registration, okay? What is really interesting, it is operational in the sense that you can also maintain ontologies and enhance, because we are learning. When we share, share data now, it's not going to be the same when we share data in 10 years. We have other concepts, other things we want to share. So the metadata itself has to evolve, okay? So this standard is explaining you, it's called registry for ontologies, how you register an ontology so that actually you can use it, okay? It's con uh, uh, completely digital. But it also tells you if you change the ontology because you're in version two, here's what you do, okay? And you have to explain the link, so it's also the, the lineage. Because if you don't understand, you don't have the lineage, it doesn't work, and actually you're not going to be able to do LLM, by the way, because LLM is about uh, this thing. You, you not only you capture the data of today, but you capture the data historical, and you learn about the whole thing. So that's the thing that is important, okay? And once you have this, you have to apply what ontology is saying, for instance, usage enforcement for privacy, for instance. So you have to have a behavioral uh, stuff. So actually, it comes to the fact that uh, the processing behind in the data space must comply with some of the enforcement using the language of the ontology, okay? So we have all those things, so it's complex. I want to mention uh, privacy, for instance. Privacy is absolutely really important. In Eclipse, uh, we just created an interest group called Models for Privacy. So it's completely uh, general, but I tell you the priority is AI and privacy and data space, okay? So uh, if you have good ideas about how you're gonna handle data usage and things like that, come and share with us in this uh, uh, working group, okay? Um, I have other things to say, but maybe it uh, depends on, okay? So for instance, adoption or market-driven, do you want me to some, say something about that? 
Um, well, maybe let's, okay. let's, let's just let the discussion go with and, and let some other people chime in first. Yeah. Um, so, um, Georg, um, you, you're very active also in practice, uh, with in, in, for instance, with language data space and language data. Uh, so, what is your view on uh, this idea of a framework of trusted ontologies and what is the, the value that, that ontologies can bring in your opinion? It's a, it's a complex discussion and a complex um, situation. So maybe the bottom line is that we, that we should not overcomplicate things, as you already indicated. Um, ontologies themselves are difficult to handle, difficult to, difficult to construct for laypersons, difficult to comprehend. Um, an important question here is how many of the data sets that we expect to be interoperable through data spaces will actually have something to do with ontologies. Yeah? So I think Alberto, was it yesterday, who said that only a very small fraction of the data sets will come with semantics. So most of the data will probably come in a bare bones way, yeah? very raw. And only a small fraction will come with expressive ontologies and semantics and so on, which of course would be nice. Yeah? It would be nice to have these ex explicit conceptualizations of a domain attached to a data set. In our field, in computational linguistics, in NLP, in AI, um, we have decades of experience with this. Yeah, we have been building various platforms and various European projects. Most recently, the European Language Grid, which now has about 17,000 resources. We have a, I think we found a good balance between expressiv expressivity and enabling discoverability of resources through a website, through this web interface. Um, and I think that's the key. Yeah? That's the key. The key is to enable people to find what they want and what they are looking for in a data space. From my point of view, we need to find the right tool, the right mechanism, the right instrument, the right whatever it is, yeah, method to enable that. Yeah, we need to enable inter not interoperability, yes, also, but discoverability of data through data spaces. And if an ontology is a good answer for, for one of these questions, then maybe it's an ontology. If it's an ontology, then we need to make sure that we don't over-engineer it. Yeah? Many people have tried to build models of the world. Those who know the Psych uh, initiative uh, will probably know what I'm talking about, where someone tried for, with his large team throughout 10 years to remodel what is in, contained in the Encyclopedia Britannica. Doug Leonard was his name. Um, and he, in the end, he failed miserably. And, and one of our main learnings is that it's not a good idea to build one ontology to rule them all, but rather to have a, a, rather, a lot, rather lean approach. So here, I would advocate for, let's first discuss the question. Yeah, so what do we want to achieve through data space interoperability? From my point of view, the answer is discoverability of data resources. Um, and then we can, can make that happen, yeah? But let's, let's not try to, to over-engineer this with, uh, yeah, so I'm getting a little itchy when I hear ontology registries because I, I've been involved in that, yeah? So um, we, we had a startup on this, uh, which also had an interesting then uh, fate. Um, I think it will, it will come, that topic, but it will take a few more years. So I will stop here. If I could just react. Uh, so uh, first of all, I fully agree with what was said. Uh, we cannot uh, just uh, complex machinery when a simple machinery is sufficient. So it all depends on the verticals and on the needs, and on in the needs for uh, going that direction or not. Okay? For instance, in energy, we are going to get maybe further than in some other domains. So it's a matter of uh, what uh, you, we sh you must do to be compliant with whatever, and whatever could be the regulation. And in some cases, it's very light, so we don't do need it. In some others, actually, they are already doing it. So it's just a matter of properly integrating. So proper integration of the vertical needs, according to a continuum, is absolutely a must in the, the data, data space. Um, final question on this team for Pierre-Antoine. Um, have we all know, of course, that the AI is booming. Do we still need ontologies? Is it, uh, what will uh, can, can it be automated, uh, semantic tagging, for instance, uh, using AI? How do you look at this uh, development? Uh, so uh, one way to answer the question would be, yes, of course, um, AI 
does a lot for ontology. It has done a lot for decades now, because let's not forget that artificial intelligence is a very broad field, that ontology design, reasoning with ontologies are subfields of artificial intelligence. So yes, AI is already there, it's doing well, thanks for asking. Uh, now, of course, the boom of AI that you're referring to is more about generative AI, large language models. Can they do something for ontologies? Probably they can, yes. Uh, last week, I was attending a presentation on how large language models can help with ontology alignment, that is creating interoperability across independently designed ontologies. There are probably many other uses of generative AI around ontologies that, uh, that, can be, that are still to be invented. However, I think there's an important key word on this slide that we must uh, not forget. It's trustable. And generative AI has a lot of impressive capabilities, but trustability is, as for now, not their strong suit. Uh, we know that generative AI sometimes hallucinates. They tend to not know what they don't know, which can be a problem. And um, to a large extent, they lack transparency. So automating all of this, honestly, uh, I don't think so. Building consensus, which is core to designing ontologies and uh, building trust, are mostly social constructs. They require all the stakeholders to be brought together and to interact with each other. Uh, AI, AI uh, and generative AI language models can possibly be being brought to the mix that would be interested to include AI in the negotiation, but in the end, it's about the stakeholders interacting with each other. And if I may digress, uh, digress a little bit, uh, I've heard a lot of good things about W3C design, uh, W3C developed ontologies such as DCAT is really important to us, or OTRL is really important to us, or PROV, another W3C ontologies. Um, and I will tell you something, those standards are not made by W3C. They are made by W3C members, okay? And as a member-led organization, W3C can only do the work and continue the work if members are interested, or to put it the other way, if the people that, that have an interest in it become members of, of the consortium. So if those things matter to you, please don't take them for granted. Uh, please get engaged and please make a stance, to paraphrase uh, Stefan. Thanks. Thank you. Does any of the other panelists still want to come back to? Uh... So, so uh, I want to come back to the energy vertical, okay? Uh, there are six or seven projects. One is uh, internet, which is a uh, support action, and then you have what you call five sister projects that are building energy data space. So we use the term CEEDS, which is Common Energy, Common European Energy Data Space, as the future vision. Obviously, it's not a silo. Obviously, it's going to be uh, linked to the SSC, okay? That's the goal, okay? So uh, um, when they are doing it, actually, uh, you have the GRC, which is actually the Joint Research Center of the Commission, is working on the smart grid, and they came up with two uh, uh, advice. One is a, a GRC code of conduct, asking a smart appliance manufacturer on, on energy to uh, use a SARF uh, ontology, okay? And the second is uh, for intraprobate testing, uh, to uh, much simpler to say, to, to be use case driven. Okay? Use case driven, test case driven. So justifying your intraprobate testing through the use case and test case. Okay? And this is why we're currently uh, checking whether generative AI can help us uh, come up with uh, faster with the use case and test case. But as a, if I can use the term, as a co-pilot, not as the single thing, okay? So helping Gen AI can do. In the future, we don't know what Gen AI can be autonomous, but Gen AI can help right now, and this is what we're trying to do right now. Thank you very much. Um, let's all move on to uh, the, the third uh, topic. Um, and now we're going away from data interoperability, data spaces interoperability. And one of the recommendations in the report um, is to um, come up with a kind of maturity model, an approach, a scorecard uh, to help uh, steer data spaces in the same direction, um, drive uh, convergence. Um, and uh, in a way, it could also serve as a onboarding mechanism to say, well, if you want to be considered as a common European data space, there are certain criteria that you need to meet 
uh, so that it would also be opened up to other data spaces that want to kind of uh, get that same, yeah, you could say, quality mark or brand. Uh, this is a question for all the panelists. Um, what do you think about this approach to, for, when it comes to data space interoperability? And what would be KPIs that you have, um, let's may, maybe maximum three, uh, what type of KPIs or, or uh, criteria would you include in such a scorecard? Um, maybe we start with Sylvia. Um, one important uh, KPI in order to, to achieve uh, interoperability is how, okay, um, we, we base the, when we explain the interoperability, we base on, on the new European interoperability model, okay, where um, we define the interoperability in four layers. The first layer is the technical interoperability that I have commented before how to solve it. But then we have the semantic interoperability, but this is not enough to achieve the interoperability. We need also the organizational interoperability and the legal, because we need to full comply with the regulations. And all these four layers need to be governed. So we need to govern of, of the four layers. So I will propose a KPI or several KPIs in, in order to see how the, the, the data space is following these uh, levels of interoperability because maybe you achieve the technical but you are not able to achieve the semantics or so on. This could be a, an idea. Okay. Thank you. Over to Stefan. Um, thank you. Um, as I'm, in a sense, representing the report here, I do not want to, to uh, judge on the sensibility of the recommendation and leave that to the, to the others um, on, on KPIs. Um, I, I mentioned uh, in the presentation of the report that we have also had an intensive look at the FAIR principles. And I think uh, the degree of implementation of the FAIR principles would be one interesting KPI. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, when it comes to maturity, we discussed this lengthily in standardization. Okay, for instance, in digital twin, there is a standard on maturity level. Okay, and uh, actually, uh, what is really interesting uh, when you do this work is you try to identify the capabilities that are needed. So it's very close to an architecture. So you look at the blueprint or the OpenDI paper. So we have like 12 building blocks and things like that, okay? So that's the starting point. And then for each of the building blocks, for instance, trust, you will say, I need this, this, and this, okay? And uh, uh, so you might have a, a scalability, you have a, a, a quite a few, let's say, elities that you can define, okay? So, but uh, at the end of the day, so for instance, in the digital twin, they had, uh, there was a paper from, uh, uh, TU Berlin researcher with eight dimensions. In the standard, we use only three, okay? So we tried to come up with something simpler, okay? But at the end of the day, I would say that my recommendation is to make sure that we will comply with the AI Act and the Cyber Resilience Act and maybe some others, because those are important. If you don't comply, your thing will not fly, okay? So the maturity is related to this assurance capability that you have to implement something that you can demonstrate will be compliant. Um, interoperability is something very complex. Like, like you said, there are a lot of layers. When it comes to interoperability, there are technical layers, like you said. I mean, if you have different data spaces, they got to be interoperable. interoperable independently of the cloud provider they choose. That's an infrastructure layer. There's all the interoperability between the different uh, artifacts that you can have inside a data space. Namely, the, the, the first artifact that you have are the participants. Well, that's another level of interoperability. How can you address the fact that uh, a participant in a data space is also who can interact with another participant from another uh, data space, and trust is built be 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 between them. Uh, then there is all the technicalities of the exchange, I mean, uh, the, the protocols and so on. And then there is 
what is at the center of the data exchange, which is the data products. And that's where all converge. How you define your product? How, uh, how can you attach uh, the proper uh, policies, terms and conditions, business models? And that's another layer, which is difficult one in terms of interoperability. How do you provide a business model in between two data spaces that don't trust each other? Well, that's a lot of complexity. There are many others, but let's keep it simple. Well, there's all these different levels, and we should have different KPIs, and the business layer is something very difficult. Right, most of the things have been said already. I think when we think about the term on the slide, the, so the, the operative word is maturity. I think maturity necessarily needs to have something to do with adoption, um, with uptake in the community, by, by the community. So a very simple way of assessing the maturity slash adoption of a data space is simply to count its participants, maybe. Yeah? <laughs> Um, so, and the data space with, let's say, 5,000 participants probably is a bit more mature than one with two, I guess. Um, then we can add other KPIs that maybe are much more EU data strategy oriented, like number of addition or the amount of additional revenue generated by having the data space versus not having the data space, because I think that's why we're doing this in the first place. Uh, when we talk about interoperability now, because essentially this is not an interoperability topic, but rather a yeah, technical maturity topic. Um, if we add interoperability in the mix, um, then we can, as was suggested, um, to check, okay, can we, can we establish connections, data transactions, trusted data transactions between data spaces? Yes, okay, that's maybe one very basic level of maturity and then we can add more, more fancy things. Yeah, so in the, in the prep meeting, we talked about interesting um, features maybe in the data space or when, you, when we talk about different types of data spaces serving different domains, how can we make data interoperable on the data level by maybe merging data sets, may, maybe merging an agriculture data set with a weather data set. And this has something to do with the Green Deal, I guess, also. So these are highly, highly complex topics when it comes to data annotation formats. Yeah, in our community alone, in NLP, I could easily mention 50 or 100 data annotation formats. If we go across all the different fields that we are catering for, we easily have a five-figure number of data annotation formats. It's probably impossible to cater for all of them, but maybe we can pick a couple of interesting use cases and address those. And even that will take another five or 10 years to get this properly done. Uh, it's hard to come, to come last, so uh, I'll be a bit provocative. Um, interoperability is a relationship. Uh, you're interoperable with something. So I think it's challenging to try and, and assess the interoperability of one data space on the scorecard as an intrinsic property of, of, of that. I mean, the complexity that Georg just, uh, just mentioned is precisely because it's a, it's a relationship and you have different interoperability with different partners. Uh, it's not to say that we couldn't find some KPIs that make, it, make a, uh, a data space likely to be more interoperable with others, but that's only part of the picture, I believe. And also maybe a word of caution, I can't remember the name of the person who stated this famous law, but as soon as a measure is used as an objective, it's, it stops to be a good measure. So that's also something that we should keep in mind with designing those KPIs. Okay. Well, thank you, thank you very much for this uh, frank uh, feedback on, on this recommendation. I think there's definitely some valuable elements that we will take into account in the further steps. Um, I think we have still three minutes. Um, I think we could try to take some questions from the audience, uh, although the, pro the problem is that we can't see you. Uh, so let me try to step out of the spotlight and see if there's any questions from uh, the audience. Yeah, I see someone. So thank you very much. And the, the quick question is, what's the importance of timing? So the time that you consume for reaching consensus versus the evolution of the data spaces and technology and so on. Who wants to take this one? 
I'm not sure I have the answer, but what I can tell you is without consensus, uh, we don't have maturity. So you can bet to go fast, but if you don't have maturity, so we're talking about uh, standardization, do we have people, the resources, but the resources is about having consensus, not about finding the technical results, okay? So yes, we need to find a more fast, a faster way to have consensus. Maybe Gen AI can help, okay? But uh, I'm not sure we have the solution, okay? So nothing will work without consensus in reality. I'm not sure I'm positive, but <laughs> that's my position. I fully disagree. <laughs> so I fully disagree because there are plenty of ontologies obsolete that nobody uses, and in fact, is worthless. So I don't mean that they are wrong. They are not wrong, but the market has more. But because there was not consensus, so I think we agree. Because if there are many ontologies and there's no agreement, there's no consensus, they are not used. So again, it's a matter of standardization. Okay. If someone has still a question, then there would be one minute left. Um, I think there's not. So then I would um, like to close the, the discussion. I would really like to thank uh, our panelists. Uh, some of them especially came over just for this, uh, this panel discussion. So really much appreciated. I hope you found it as valuable as I did. And uh, yeah, good uh, travels home uh, later on. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you.